I didn't really push the way I should have. And I remember vividly interviewing and meeting with a dean at a med school, and he mentioned my grades. And I, I mentioned something about, gee, I thought it, you know, it's very important to to be engaged in uh, extracurricular activities that are important in, in governance and other things. And he and he just said, well, I guess you were wrong. <laughs> Paging Dr. Cook. Paging Dr. Cook. Dr. Cook, you're wanted in the OR. Dr. Cook, you're wanted in the OR. Welcome to the Prescription for Success podcast with your host, Dr. Randy Cook. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Prescriptions for Success. I'm Dr. Randy Cook, your host for the podcast, a production of MD Coaches, providing leadership and executive coaching for physicians by physicians to overcome burnout, transition your career, develop as a leader, or whatever your goal might be. Visit MD Coaches on the web at mymdcoaches.com because you're not in this alone. And don't forget that CME credit is available when you listen with us. Just look for CMFI in the show notes to learn how. My guest today is Chief of Acute Care Surgery for the Atrium Health System and Carolina's Medical Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. Previously, he was Chairman for Surgical Sciences and Professor of Surgery and Anesthesiology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, where he was Director of Surgical Critical Care and Program Director of Vanderbilt's Surgical Critical Care and Acute Care Surgery Fellowship for 17 years. So, let's hear my conversation with Dr. Addison May. Well, I'm really excited today to be speaking with a fellow surgeon, something that I don't often get to do. Dr. Addison May is with us from uh, Charlotte. You are in Charlotte, are you not, Addison? That's correct. And welcome to Prescription for Success. Uh, I'm really excited to have you here. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Well, let's get right down to business. Uh, As we always do, Addison, I like to start uh, at the beginning of the story with with your origins. I know that uh, you did uh, your early training in Virginia. Are you a Virginia native or uh, did you grow up someplace else? Actually, I grew up here in Charlotte uh, many years ago. I yeah. did, and um, had been gone from Charlotte for probably forty years. Uh, went away to college, mm. and 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 didn't move back. Family always been in the area, and then you know my wife always said, "Is there a reason you'd want to move back to Charlotte?" Uh, and there there weren't positions at the any of those sure. times that really attracted me, but was recruited back four years ago, and it's been nice to move back home. Yeah, sounds like you're glad to be back home again. That's great. And I'm also interested in how our guests happen to find their way into the medical profession. There are so many stories. How about you? Was it something uh, that you dreamed of as a five-year-old, or was it later? Well, my father was a physician. He was an OBGYN here in town. Uh, I'm the youngest of five. I'm the only one that, that actually went into medicine. Really? And I, I don't know that I actually ever ever really thought I would do anything different. Went away to college and just assumed that I probably would become a doctor. And that probably led to one of my life's biggest lessons and that I'm not sure. I, I accepted it so much, I'm not sure I put enough energy directly towards it. And hmm. probably rightly so, I was not accepted to med school the first time I applied. And uh, that was probably the, the best lesson that ever happened to me at that time, I then recognized that I would never, never let sort of being undirected or uh, a lack of energy limit uh, what I would do going forward, that I would always put my best foot forward. So to me, that was a a good thing. I would love to hear you talk about that some more because I was one of those guys. 
uh, that it took me two applications to get in medical school. And uh, it is truly a bit of a, you know, I don't know if it's a life-changing moment, but it certainly is, or it was for me, a time of profound self-reflection. And I'd like to know a little bit more about what was in your head at that time. Well, I went undergraduate to University of Virginia, and I was very actively involved in some of the student self-governance and in a number of committees and perceive that as being very important to me and, and important sort of globally. <laughs> and, you know, my grades were okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I just didn't, um, I didn't really push the way I should have. And I remember vividly interviewing and meeting with a dean at a med school and he mentioned my grades and I, I mentioned something about, gee, I thought it, you know, it's very important to, to be engaged in uh, extracurricular activities that are important in, in governance and other things. And he, and he just said, well, I guess you were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Did he really? <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, okay. <laughs> um, wow. And, you know, but again, I, that led to a period of me thinking, okay, well, well you know, i work a couple jobs and study hard and worked in sort of actually worked in a microbiology lab. I was a mm -hmm. uh, biology uh, graduate uh, degree undergrad and um, had a fabulous time working in a clinical micro lab in a hospital and you know, redoing studying for MCATs and did another uh, yeah. job. And uh, I just said, okay, well, if I apply myself, I think I can get in. And then I wasn't going to let a lack of energy limit my uh, academic performance going forward, I, I did feel like, you know, you ought to learn things to be the best doctor, not to mm -hmm. necessarily do well on the test. But my theory was that if you learn to be the best doctor, you'd do well on the test too. You bet. So all that worked out, worked out for the best in the, in the end. Yeah. And you wound up in Charleston at Medical University of South Carolina was on, on that second round of applications was that your only choice or were there other choices? I, I'm really interested in the rest of the story. Well, you know, when I when I didn't get into medical school, I looked at thinking about, okay, where, where could I work in a research lab? Where could I do things like that? Mm -hmm. And that was the period when the Reagan cutbacks were just put into place and <laughs> everybody was uh, short on money and there really wasn't a lot of opportunity. And, uh, mm -hmm had some connections in, in Charleston and, and looked at a, in a position there. And the gentleman that ran the, the hospital at Charleston Memorial Hospital ran the path lab and the micro lab and, and all uh, gave me an opportunity to work in the, in the micro lab and mm -hmm. uh, also do phlebotomy and that's sort of a jack of all trades actually. Yeah. And it, it was fabulous, fabulous experience, uh, but gave me the opportunity to meet, uh, local people there and and opportunity to take time to I hadn't really worked to study for my MCATs the first time either so mm -hmm. was able to put those at a pretty high level and and was able to get into med school and so when you went back for interviews uh, I would imagine uh, that that gave you an opportunity to say you know I really thought this over and uh, I've done some hard work in the interim and I and I think I'm probably a better uh, candidate than a lot of these guys that are just uh, coming out of colleges am I Am I in the right ballpark? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I guess I always, it's always hard for me to put myself up against somebody else. I could tell them why I thought that I would be a good physician mm -hmm. um, and why I would do well and that I knew I could put uh, great energy towards it. And um, they also offered the opportunity after I got in, you could start early and take uh, anatomy. They offered some people, I guess the whole class, but there was only limited spots uh, that you could start during the summer. And since I had been out, I decided to do that. And it, that really enabled me to get mm -hmm. started well on the right foot and finish the top of the anatomy class. And then you yeah. could then you could tutor uh, during the semester. So that, that ended up being quite good. I, I do vividly remember... There was a student that had finished, I think, third in their class at Duke, who was in our class, and had the highest MCAT score I'd ever heard, <laughs> and got into school 
and did basically what I did in undergrad, didn't really apply themselves, just assumed yeah. that, that they were going to do well. And mm -hmm. they got a very bad, fl flunked the first test and got a very, mm -hmm. uh, did not do well. And, and you could tell that for this individual that it was the first time that they had ever failed and doubted. Right. And it took that individual probably the first two clinical years to get back on solid footing and then sort of turn it around. Uh, so, you know, failing when you're younger and, and coming back from it is a great lesson and a great thing. So, I, yep. again, uh, failing before getting to med school is probably better than failing during med school. I really appreciate you sharing that with us because it is such an important lesson, I think. And then I'm, I'm interested to know that once you got underway at, uh, at, in Charleston uh, at MUSC, did, did you find uh, the, the labor of being a medical student, uh, was it really difficult or were you of such a mindset that you knew what you had to do and got it done? What, what was your state of mind at that point? For me, it was, I mean, I think you, you worked hard, uh, but I was used to working hard. To me, it was, it was fun because you were learning to do what you wanted to do and, you know, the body and, and human physiology and, and all is just so, so fascinating and such a wonderful thing mm -hmm. uh, that for me, putting all that together was fun. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the... The good thing, the easy thing is that, you know, if you surround yourself by people who are working hard, it's easy to do that. It's difficult to surround yourself by people who aren't in med school who are out, able yeah. to go out every night. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be miserable if you do that. Yeah. Uh, but, it, you know, I trained during the time when, you know, in residency, we were every other night call. And mm -hmm. I look back on it and would not have changed any of my education and enjoyed the whole whole part of my training. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, to me, it's all how you frame it. Today's episode is brought to you by Doc to Doc Lending. Doc to Doc provides match day loans of up to twenty five thousand to fourth year medical students and current residents. These loans are designed to help students cover personal expenses such as moving costs, housing down payments, and living expenses before and during residency. With fixed interest rates, flexible repayment terms, and no prepayment penalties, Doc to Doc Match Day loans provide financial flexibility and allow students to focus on their exciting journey towards becoming a physician. Doc to Doc was founded for doctors by doctors. They understand the challenges and hard work involved in becoming a doctor, and they support doctors throughout their careers. Using their in-house lending platform, doc to doc considers the unique financial considerations of doctors that are not typically considered by traditional financial institutions. So don't let financial stress hold you back from achieving your goals. doc to doc lending has you covered. Visit www.doc2doclending.com slash mdcoaches to learn more. Hi, I'm Rhonda Crow, founder and CEO for MD Coaches. Here on RX for Success, we interview a lot of great medical professionals on how they grew their careers, how they overcame challenges, and how they handle day-to-day -day work. I really hope you're getting a lot of great information. But if you're looking for an answer to a specific problem, management or administration challenge, or if you're feeling just a, a bit burnt out, like maybe you chose the wrong career, well, then there's a faster way to get the help you need. No, it's not counseling, it's coaching. Rx for Success is produced by MD Coaches, a team of physicians who have been where you are. I know you're used to going it alone, but you don't have to. Get the support you need today. Visit us at mymdcoaches.com to schedule your complimentary consultation. Again, that's mymdcoaches.com because you're not in this alone. We'll get back to our interview in just a moment. But right now, I want to tell you a little bit about Physician Outlook. If you haven't discovered this remarkable magazine, please do so very soon. 
It was created by physicians for physicians to showcase the intersection between clinical and non-clinical interests, whether it's writing, painting, cooking, politics, and dozens of other topics, Physician Outlook gives a physician perspective. It's available online and in print. It's really unique among physician lifestyle magazines. And like the Prescription for Success podcast, Physician Outlook amplifies the voice of any physician who has something to say. It also engages patients who still believe in physician-led, team-based care. And Prescription for Success listeners can get three months free when you enter our promo code RX for success and select the monthly option at checkout. That's a really great deal on this stunning publication. And now let's get back to today's interview. Well, that's a good segue into the uh, postdoctoral training. Um, moved on to University of Virginia for that phase of your training and. I didn't actually ask you if you did any serious thinking during medical school about whether it was going to be surgery from the beginning or was it a, a, a later decision. But in any case, uh, you, 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 it was a, it was a very late decision. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I liked everything so much that actually back at that time, the application deadline was much earlier in the year before you uh-huh. could complete all your extra rotation. So I ended up applying in medicine and surgery and OBGYN because I wasn't sure which which I really wanted until I wow. redid a second rotation in the fourth year. And then I look back, I'm like, you know, how could I have ever thought I would have wanted to do that? But, you know, to me, yeah. uh, yeah, liking a lot is better than only liking <laughs> small Absolute, area of medicine. Absolutely. <laughs> So you moved on to Virginia uh, for a surgery residency, and did you feel like you were in the right spot from the beginning, or were there ever any second thoughts? Oh, no, I thought I was at the right spot. I, I applied residencies all over the country. Uh, I had done a fourth-year rotation in Seattle and uh, applied in Seattle and Colorado and UCSF and Stanford. And But really, the program director at the University of Virginia, he, he's really the reason uh, when I loved loved the program and uh, loved uh, how they ran the program and and really sort of put self governance uh, to the residents um, on how we were going to get things done and you know he he gave out responsibility and authority as long as you met your responsibility you were going to keep your authority and uh, it was just a it was mm-hmm. a great place to train and the chairman was just such a fabulous man uh, so uh, I've, I've clearly would not have done anything differently. And the other thing that's really interesting to me about your CV, Addison, is, you know, a lot of people get into their residency and it's pretty grueling. And the biggest thing on their mind is getting it over with. You actually took a pause in the middle to do a research fellowship. You want to tell us about that? Yeah, I did two years of uh, research in an area of sort of uh, surgical infections that happened to align with my micro interest. And one of my mentors there was a I didn't think he could be boarded in as many things he was boarded in. Uh, he was uh, <laughs> boarded in medicine and surgery, transplant, and ID, and critical care, because you could grandfather in critical care. So I think he had five boards, just a brilliant man, and ran a, a great lab and had some very productive residents who were the year ahead of me in the lab. And yeah, I'd always had interest in, in microbiology and, and infections, and so that worked quite well. For me, I don't know that I thought about it prospectively, but after you do it and you look back, I, I, you know, I, I think even if you never do research again, the period of deep research does help you mature and understand really complex process and mm-hmm. understand that anecdote doesn't necessarily uh, shouldn't drive uh, clinical decision making and. Uh, it was a fabulous experience and, and has uh, substantially altered sort of my pathway through uh, through medicine throughout the rest of my life. Yeah, I, I bet it has. And, 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 and as I reflect on my own career, you know, if I were armed with what I know now, that that is exactly what I would like to do is uh, spend some more time in those academic institutions. And uh, once you finished up at Virginia, uh, you decided that you were going to do some more training in this time uh, in trauma and surgical critical care. How'd you come to that decision? Similar to my approach the first time, I like sort of everything. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, when I went through 
But I realized that I like complexity and I like sort of full systems of care. I uh, came uh, for a long time. Uh, transplant was also of interest to me. Mm-hmm. It's similar in that, hey, to really provide the highest level of care, you, you have to interface in systems. And so I liked taking patients who were really sick and trying to make them better, I think is probably what what appealed to me the most. Um, no better place to do that with tra- yeah. than with trauma, man, I'm telling yeah. you. That's, uh, you. You sort of do everything that there is to do. And uh, after uh, finishing up with your fellowship, well, I can't really tell from looking at the CV, did you, uh, was it on completion of your shell- fellowship that you went to UAB or later? That's correct. That was my yeah. first academic position was uh, at UAB. Yeah. Uh, spent four years in, in Birmingham. It was a great opportunity and great first job. And How'd you um, pick them? Well, that's <laughs> a good, good story. I, you know, I was in Philadelphia, Philadelphia University of Pennsylvania doing my fellowship. At the time, the, act, the, uh, the, the finances of healthcare was going through one of those big mergers and then places going belly up with some frequency and thinking about jobs in the Northeast. I, I, I'm not from the Northeast, although my wife's epicenter is closer to the Northeast. And I looked at positions and I, I wanted to be in a busy place, but not a place that was already had a tremendous number of faculty. Mm-hmm. Uh, and UAB was uh, a, a great place and busy. And I would join a, an established, but but not a big group, and it also provided the opportunity to, to, to do research. Mm-hmm. Now, I mentioned my wife's epicenter is probably uh, further north than that. She grew up outside Washington, but, but her family's from Massachusetts originally, and she spent a lot of time in Massachusetts. And I came home and said, uh, hey, dear, I'm thinking about a job in Birmingham. And she goes, Birmingham? <laughs> I'll move to England. And I said, England, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, Alabama. No. She goes Alabama. What? <laughs> so, uh, but she's a she's a great sport, and we had a great time in in Birmingham. It's great. I'm time. glad to hear that. Yeah, yeah, UAB is actually where I went to medical school, and at the time, uh, uh, the great John Crooklyn was there. Oh and, yeah. Um, you you uh, the, the people that wanted a surgery residency there were just too numerous to count, uh, which is why I elected not to. But. Uh, it was a great uh, research center back then, and I think it was probably in, uh, uh, in in those years as well. But yet, apparently along came an opportunity to be uh, a faculty member at Vanderbilt, and I'd like to hear about that. Yeah, I got recruited to Vanderbilt. I actually had went to it. I wasn't looking. Uh, I went to a talk in Birmingham put on in, about a surgical infectious disease topic, and the speaker happened to be from Vanderbilt. And she had actually quoted a couple of studies that I uh, had done when I was in residency. And wow. uh, my my wife went up to her and, and said, hey, you know, you mentioned a couple of things, quoted my husband a bit, and I, so I <laughs> met her. And she said, well, oh, you know, by the way, we're, we're looking to recruit uh, someone to run our surgical critical care at, at Vanderbilt, and uh, you should come, come look at it. How about so that? I did. And uh, it was a great opportunity. And it was a, a great move for us, and uh, we loved Nashville. It's a great town. And uh, you're there for a good while. So uh, yeah, you, you must years. have really felt like you had landed in exactly the right place. You want to tell us about some of the things that you did and uh, some of the ways that you grew while you were there? Yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, you talk about things being the right place. We, we were there 17 years, and it was fabulous. Our daughters were raised there. But, you know, one of the things that you learn, it doesn't matter whether it's surgery or private practice or industry or academic surgery, you know, there are always challenges and always politics and always everything, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and figuring out how to how to navigate those things. Maybe it's easy in retrospect, never easy when you're in the middle of it. Vanderbilt was a fabulous opportunity and felt like things were growing and moving forward throughout throughout the time but but there were clearly politics and and things that you felt yeah. threatened and learned lessons along the way on getting things done and and maneuvering and surviving politics so uh, you know I think that's just part and parcel to everything that we do um that is kind of the nature of academic medicine I think 
And, it is uh, the nature of academic medicine for sure. It, it, in our organization, some uh, it, the organization leadership on the physician side doing a great job to try and, hey, we want this to be a great place to work. And they put out a survey on what can we do. And, you know, it's probably, uh, I might speak to some of this later. Healthcare has become big and complex. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's so complex that you really have to change your approach to how you solve problems because you it's not it's not easy and straightforward to just get problems solved because you're now in big organizations. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I think a lot of, it, if I'm in pract- private practice in a group of, you know, X number, you can probably solve problems pretty quickly. But now that things have merged and become bigger and bigger and bigger organizations, you really have to be able to sort of reset your rheostat, I think, mm-hmm. uh, to put pressure over time. And as long as you're moving things forward, that's a, a good thing. Uh, and you can achieve really fabulous things if you're willing to do pressure over time. But most of these changes and in, in frustrations that you have aren't going to be settled uh, easily because it's mm-hmm. just, it's become so complex. It's not mm-hmm. the same uh, world that most of us joined you know, if you joined anything yeah. over 20 years ago, it's way different. And those changes in frustrations, it, it, it sounds to me, and I want you to speak to the subject if you're willing, uh, is that what uh, brought about the move back to North Carolina? Well, the move to North Carolina, I think, um, really was driven by opportunity. Vanderbilt at the time, it just pulled separate from the undergraduate institution at a big price tag uh, and so didn't have, wasn't in a position to be a system. Atrium Health, uh, Carolina's medical system at the time, had become a system and so the opportunity was to have an impact on a much larger patient care footprint uh, for the really the great predominantly the greater Charlotte region, which is a big area. At the time, there were a few other hospitals aligned outside that area, but system's much bigger now. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's what attracted me because the position was not only division chief over the flagship hospital here, uh, acute care surgery division at Carolina's Medical Center, but but also to advance integration for acute care surgery across our system in the greater Charlotte market. And that was an interesting challenge. It's a, it's a lot of patients that you can, if you do it right, you're, you're making a big impact. Well, that's a great story. So, so it sounds like you're very satisfied uh, with the move back to North Carolina. What, uh, what's on the radar looking forward? How many more years are you going to practice? Well, I'm, I'm 62 now, going on 63. My suspicion is it's probably another five years before the things that I'm trying to create would be enduring. Mm-hmm. You know, be able to outlive my just stepping away from it. I, I suspect that's the length of time. So I'll probably do what I'm doing for another five years, mm-hmm. uh, though. You know, one one reason the way I got to to know you is um, in five years I saw my my father just do his clinical work until he retired, and that transition to retirement I don't think was that easy because he he didn't have anything that kept him engaged. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd like to I'd like to remain engaged, but that's not an easy. It sounds easy, but figuring out how to, you know, we all put too much time into our primary job. So yeah. figuring out what that pivot will be is is not always straightforward. Can you name some of those things that you have left to do? Yeah, here it, it's really probably creating a structure within the organization that, that allows integration of care for the patient care condition. So in, when I join they said you know we're an integrated sort of hospital system and we need you to advance this but in fact you know if if your hospital system that has been independent hospitals 
you may or may not have a structure that allows you to be efficient and effective across a region and have synergy uh, for patient care conditions. Mm -hmm. So we have a good number of hospitals, at least nine hospitals in this region uh, that do some component of acute care surgery. You know, that's 40 to 50,000 patients a year with emergency general surgery, critical care, and trauma. So it's a large group. And there's an opportunity to have that same sort of synergy actually go across the enterprise. Uh, so that would be my goal to move the structure forward enough where uh, we can measure how we're doing, we can leverage successes across the organization and continuously increase the value of care that we're that we're offering. Well, Addison, I think you're um, the very definition of a professional life well spent, and uh, I appreciate you sharing with us, and uh, I'm uh, looking forward to kind of keeping track of you and uh, seeing how these uh, uh, last few years of ambition work out for you. I bet it's going to be fabulous. We have arrived at the part of the program that uh, I think most people come for, uh, and that is when I get out of the way and allow the guests to speak on their own. So we're going to do that. And uh, audience, I'm going to close my mic. Dr. Addison May is going to share his personal prescriptions for success. Well, thank you. This has been quite a, a joy and a privilege to be on today. I felt challenged to be able to narrow it to three but I'll, I'll give three prescriptions that have been, I think, most important for me. The first one I would throw out is read. Initiate a reading program. For me, this includes a mixture of genres that, that include performance, change management, leadership, self-help books mixed in with history and a little bit of fiction. My program didn't really start until after my daughters talked me into getting an iPad mini and downloading on Kindle, uh, Kindle on the mini. I've been amazed at how much reading I can get done walking from place to place or at the gym. And I never did that prior to having that device. For me, it's, it's sort of what I call repetitive reading uh, serves sort of as a coaching mechanism for, for me, um, reading eras that I feel like I could could or should improve or areas which I feel stressed. And, and then even with history, you learn uh, and it supports your own performance. You know, the data is, is strong that most of the top performing CEOs in the country do a lot of independent reading. So that would probably be my first. The program really enabled me to react to stress and uh, challenges uh, in ways that without it, I probably would not have been able to change how I approach things or learned how to survive through some of those challenges. The second thing I would throw out is throw your life a curve. Now, I, that title comes from an HBR, uh, Harvard Business Review summary uh, that comes across uh, emails it's a great little article, and what I mean by that is give yourself multiple areas of engagement to create the opportunity for several acquisition curves. Humans by far and away are happiest when they feel as if they are on a steep part of an acquisition curve. And I felt that way. I was always on a steep part of an acquisition curve in my job, and I but, you know, 99% of my life towards my job. But out of your control, things can occur that all of a sudden you feel like individuals are lobbing grenades under your cot or something happens that is beyond your control that, that you're no longer on that acquisition curve. If that's the only thing you're putting your energy to, you don't have resilience. You're Life typically, if that's all you're putting your energy to, is is not particularly enjoyable at that time. I remember vividly people saying, oh, you should be more balanced. You should be X. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I like what I'm doing. 
And it took me a long time to recognize that being resilient means you need some balance in activities. That way you can pivot to things that are going well and tread water in the things that you need to just tread water and and let circumstances change where you can get back to an acquisition curve. So if I would have done that much sooner in my career had I been wise enough to do so. The third prescription I would say is just advance the needle. And in my discussion with with Randy Cook, maybe inferred a little bit of, of this. When I say just advance the needle, I mean changing your framework in your mind. As long as what you're putting your energy to is advancing, you're not moving backwards. And that's a success. And you should envision that as a success. Many of my colleagues that are frustrated, you know, surgeons are, for the most part, fairly compulsive individuals. Acute care surgeons like to put a lot of energy to a problem, uh, fix it, and be gone. That's great for uh, resuscitating a critically ill or injured patient. It, It doesn't work in complex organizations. It's really how you frame the problem. To solve problems and make things better, you need to be able to step back and say, well, is my energy advancing the needle? And if it is, you're moving the needle forward. And being able to maintain sustained pressure over time is really the only way to achieve problem-solving in complex settings, particularly in complex organizations. So those are the the three things that, you know, if I had been able to do it 20 or 25 years ago, I'd probably be much further along and had much less stress in my in my career uh, over time. So with that, I'll end my prescriptions for success. Well, Dr. Addison May, that's a uh, that's pretty good recipe. Read, throw yourself a curve, and just advance the needle. And uh, no doubt if we had the capacity to understand those things when we were young, we, we probably would be more effective. But uh, yeah. that's, that's part of, the that's nature part of, of getting to where you know that this, these are the things we're supposed to think about. Exactly. So, that's you don't learn by being right. No, you don't. <laughs> As, this has been a lot of fun. Before we go, uh, I want you to uh, share with us as much information as you would like to about how people can uh, find you and contact you, whether it's email addresses or books coming up or speeches you're going to be giving. What have you got for us? Well, uh, folks are always welcome to email me. Uh, my email address is addison.may at atriumhealth.org. Be delighted for anyone to reach out to me. Most of my 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 books and publications are probably uh, fairly esoteric for for the audience. Uh, so I'm happy for people to reach out to me and happy to help share things in any any way that I can. So this has been been my pleasure and a lot of fun. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, I certainly have. And uh, uh, once again, thank you so much for being here, Dr. Addison May. Thank you so much for listening with us today. We hope you'll help us reach more listeners with your five-star rating and also visit our Patreon page for membership-only material like personal rapid-fire Q&A sessions with our guests. To be sure you never miss an episode, visit our website at rxforsuccesspodcast.com to subscribe. And while you're there, check out our companion podcast, Life-Changing Moments with Dr. Dale Waxman. Both podcasts make you eligible for CME credit from CMFI. Details are available on our website. Special thanks to Ryan Jones, who created and performs our theme music. Also to Craig Clausen of Clausen Solutions Group, who edits the show. And remember, be sure to fill your prescription for success with my next episode. <laughs>